Okay, so hello and welcome everyone. Our people are still trickling in, but we'll get started on our presentation today. So welcome to our May store release, uh, What's New for Workplace Service Delivery. Uh, we're so excited to have you here and go through our latest release. So before we get into it, I'd love to introduce who will be going through our presentation today. Um, first, I would love to introduce Allison. She is our Director of Outbound Product Management for Workplace Service Delivery. Um, myself, I'm Claire. I'm on Outbound Product Management. Um, and also Elizabeth, who is my coworker here for Outbound Product Management for Workplace Service Delivery as well. We will be your host today for our presentation. Um, and we're so excited to have you here. So this is just a safe harbor at any point. If we cover anything future facing roadmap, um, we do like to safe harbor ourselves. Uh, that may change going into the future with the scope um, of what is planned on our roadmap. And uh, please join us if you do enjoy our live on service now series. Um, the link will be shared in today's chat. We have other offerings. Um, on our community page here. So please join us for future webinars and meetups. And some housekeeping items as we go through, please stay on mute. There will be a question and answer after the presentation. So use that feature to ask questions throughout the session. So if you, there is the chat, you can engage in the chat, but put your questions um, in the Q&A portion so we can make sure we're answering those. Um, feel free to introduce yourself when asking a question. We love to know who you are. And this session is going to be recorded. So if you do have to drop, if you miss something you want to rewatch, um, this is going to be recorded and shared on our ServiceNow community forum. And then after the session, you'll be prompted to fill out a survey. We appreciate your feedback and would love to um, make these sessions even more um, engaging for you as possible. So this is today's agenda. We are going to first cover a super high level version of what's new in our May release. We will then have Allison present workplace analytics and our updates there. I will cover health and safety. Um, Elizabeth will do space recommender enhancements, reservation enhancements, and Allison will do indoor mapping. Um, so a lot of content here and looking forward to all the questions that you might have on our presentation. So for a summary of what's new in our May release, we have some new features and enhancements. So our new feature um, is a workplace analytics dashboard. And with that, we have space optimization, maintenance management, and lease administration workplace analytics. And so Allison will cover those a little bit more in depth. For health and safety here for our major enhancements, we now have the ability to track visitors, whether it be on a health and safety incident, an injury, an illness, an investigation. Um, and we also have some minor enhancements as well. We have some updates on navigation and for ease of use on employees so based on feedback that we've received on our navigation and user experience. We have the ability now for email notifications sent to the employee with any public update and also some workspace enhancements. So again, we'll cover this more in depth. We have some demos prepared, so we'll actually show it live in a demo instance, um, and we'll put all this into context. We are then going to cover indoor mapping enhancements, um, some reservation management enhancements, as well as space recommender enhancements. So I don't want to cover this too thoroughly because then we'll steal the meat of our presentation today, but just wanted to give a summary if you do want to look back after our presentation and see um, a, at a glance everything that will be covered in May. Okay, so now I will switch off to Allison. I'll talk to you guys in a little bit for health and safety, but I'll share for Allison. Great, thank you, Claire. So I am excited to talk about workplace analytics and what we released in May. And I'll first start by talking about why we made this investment and set some kind of context. So our customers and really all organizations are constantly on a path of being more data centric with their operations and their decisions as it relates to their workplace. And this has really become even more of a priority in this new era of hybrid and flexible work especially because we know that occupancy trends are much different than they were just a few years ago. And so really, if we can go to the next slide, workplace analytics is a set of dashboards that unlock insights and uh, key performance indicators across three key areas of the workplace service delivery suite. So we can see here space optimization, 
lease administration, and workplace maintenance. And we do have some screenshots here, but what I'm going to do, I'm going to take over screen share and I'm going to give a quick tour of the dashboards because nothing um, shows off a dashboard like a live demo. So give me one second to take over screen share. All right. So you are all now seeing what we call Workplace Central. And I'm specifically clicked into the Workplace Analytics dashboard, but very quickly, I want to highlight the fact that Workplace Central is really your access point for several things across the Workplace Service Delivery Suite. So you can do things like create a space scenario plan. You can do things like review your preventive maintenance and make a maintenance plan here directly from Workplace Central. And you can even do things with uh, workplace lease administration. So you can review some data and also create new workplace lease contracts directly from this Workplace Central uh, dashboard. But going back to the focus topic for today, which is again, workplace analytics, here you can see the um, subcategory dashboards that we referred to. So again, space optimization, lease administration, and maintenance management. And first, if we look at this dashboard for space optimization, one of the first things I want to call out is the fact that we have delivered out of the box several um, possibilities for uh, slicing and dicing this data. So you can see you're able to uh, filter by uh, date. So let's say you want to say uh, a custom date range or maybe even year to date. That's all available uh, quickly here from this filter area. You're also able to filter by things like region, cost center, or department, because we know that's a common way to really understand how your space is being utilized. So you can see there are a handful of reports that are available for you to review as it relates to space optimization. I won't read through all of them, but there are two personal favorites here that I'll call out. First is peak utilization days. So this really helps you understand when are your employees typically coming into the workplace? When is their buzz? Where is their popularity? And in passing and talking with uh, our customers, what we're hearing from a lot of um, you is that Mondays and Fridays tend to be maybe a bit quieter and your days of peak utilization tend to be Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. But this really helps unlock that data and helps you visualize that. Another one of my favorites here is space type utilization. So here we just have in our demo data, um, you know, rooms versus workspaces or desks. But this helps you understand when employees are coming into the workplace, are they tending to make um, room reservations, maybe conference rooms, or are they really coming in for more quiet individual work and just reserving those workspaces or those desks? Um, the other thing that I'll mention about all of these workplace analytics dashboards is that we have documentation on all of the calculations and how we're defining utilization and calculating everything that you see here. So if you're interested to learn more on any of these, that's out on docs.servicenow.com specifically. So this is space optimization. Let's click into lease administration next. So here you can see that we also have the ability to filter your leases. And this filter by default is set to region. And really one of the first things that you see under lease administration is essentially a bird's eye overview of all of your different contracts and the status. So whether they're active, expiring, um, maybe they're in draft. And then you can see various data points like your contracts by vendor, by model, by payment schedule. Um, there's a lot of different data that's available and surfaced here really for you to understand some of the key information about the various uh, workplace lease contracts that you have across your portfolio. And then next we have maintenance management. So again, similarly, we have the ability to filter for the maintenance management dashboard. You can do that by a date range. Um, and then we see some um, kind of KPIs here across the top. And I'm just working off of a laptop today, but if I make this a little bit bigger, we can see some of these. And you can also click here into the more information icon to see what everything is here. But you can see, for example, you are able to review your plan maintenance percentage, your plan maintenance um, compliance, your mean time to repair, the number of open maintenance cases that you have. Um, I won't read through everything, but again, just picking out some favorites. One of the insights that I like about this dashboard is the ability for you to actually visualize your trend over time for how much of your maintenance is preventive. You're being proactive about that maintenance versus how much of that is corrective. Maybe things are being reported by employees and it indicates that perhaps you need to schedule more preventive maintenance in between on some of those uh, things that are popping up here. Um, the other thing that I'd like to point out is just your average age of maintenance cases. So how long is it really taking your workplace or facilities team to complete that maintenance? And again, splitting that out by both corrective and preventive. 
So a lot to explore. Definitely encourage all of you to check out the workplace um, analytics, analytics dashboards directly in your instance if you're already a customer or a partner and to review our documentation to learn more again about all of the various reports that are here. But that is all for now for workplace analytics. So Claire, I will pass it back over to you to talk about health and safety. Awesome. Thank you, Allison. And I'll share my screen here. So we are going to cover both the major and minor enhancements for health and safety in the May release. And our first major enhancement is health and safety visitor tracking. So with this update, we now have the abilities to track visitors on health and safety incidents and investigations. So we'll walk through both how an employee can do it, and then we'll also go in and see how your health and safety teams would be able to track these the visitors on um, health and safety investigations as well. So we'll first go through a demo instance and we'll click through it and get that pulled up for us here. What we're looking at right now is our employee's point of view and she is logging a health and safety incident. So if an incident occurs in the office, say for example, our employee Maria has gone into the office and she has a customer on site there um, doing a tour of the office for a customer visit. And unfortunately, while the customer is in the office, the customer slips um, in the lobby and so Maria here needs to report it to her health and safety team. And so this might look familiar for you, but our, and for those that it is not familiar, we are able to report any health and safety incident. She can fill out any categories um, for the type of incident. So it was an, um, a injury or illness. We can fill in the affected persons. And now with the May release, we now can add an affected visitor. Um, the visitor has to be put into service now um, and registered as a visitor. So we'll walk through some of the uh, ways to do that in a little bit. I have a slide for that. But essentially, one thing to note here is this visitor field is pulling from a visitor table. So our visitor would have to be registered um, beforehand in order to um, associate the visitor to this incident. So we'll just log our visitor here, pulls up as their email. Um, we can do the location that we're at and then submit that off to our health and safety team um, for an investigation process. So say like Isabel slipped lobby and then we'll choose our location here. and submit that off. And we have to select a date. Perfect. So for our next update that I wanna cover is the ability to then see those incidents um, and the visitors on the incidents and be able to log them there as well. So we'll just take an existing one and we'll walk through some of the updated fields here. Um, within the May update, our health and safety teams and those with the role to work on health and safety incidents and or investigations will now be able to add affected visitors within the incident here. So again, it will pull from that visitor table um, of the visitors that have already been checked in either for, through health and safety or workplace service delivery. As we go through for our injury and illness as well, if we were to create a new injury or illness, say for example, both the employee and the visitor were injured um, in the incident, you would not have to create multiple incidents. You could create um, two injuries on that incident. We can either add the person type as visitor or employee from this dropdown. Um, and if we add the visitor, we can, uh, again, pull in their information um, if they've already been logged in, um, again, allowing our team to know exactly uh, what visitors are in the office and if an injury or incident has occurred. And last, in our investigation process, uh, within our investigation workbench here, we are able, once it loads, we can add people involved and also associate those internal um, or those external employee or external visitors as well. So we can track internal employees, external visitors, um, and making sure that you have visibility across the entire investigation process, regardless if the uh, person involved is internal or external to the organization. 
So for our health and safety visitor tracking, uh, we saw how we can track visitors on both health and safety incidents and investigations. We really got the, we did this because we got customer feedback about needing to track both investigations for employees as well as visitors that are coming on site in the workplace as well. One thing to call out and note about this is depending on your package, um, that visitor table will be different, that you'll be populating that the employee, that your, your own employees will um, register that visitor in. So this is um, something to note, but please feel free to reach out to your account teams depending on your license and what your license for. It will look a little bit different, but I did want to cover it at a super high level here. Essentially, if you are licensed to the health and safety SKU, then your employees will need to visit or register a visit um, in the set up a visit record producer. If you're licensed to work by service delivery professional or enterprise SKUs, um, then you would need to register a visitor using register a guest. So essentially, health and safety does not have visitor management, but there is a record producer um, to register that visitor. Workplace service delivery and enterprise SKUs um, have visitor management, and so you would be able to use your full visitor management that you're familiar with within workplace service delivery. But again, depending on your SKU, what you're licensed to, please feel free to reach out to your account team and they can clarify um, some questions around this as well, especially if you have a legacy SKU, um, we can answer some of those questions. So for some minor um, enhancements here, I did want to cover, I'll walk through some um, PowerPoint here, but we did add the ability for incidents and observations to be created directly within the health and safety workspace. So at the top here, we can see buttons that allow you to create a new incident or a new observation. We added this essentially to reduce the amount of clicks for where to create incidents and observations. So if a health and safety team has someone who walks into the office or a phone call or even an email um, for those employees that are um, submitting incidents and observations not in the employee center, we now have the ability to create that new incident and observation right within the workspace that they're working um, and spending the majority of their time. How you activate it, you will upgrade to Utah, and essentially it's that a button that will allow you to directly create that observation directly in the workspace. Our next update is we now have drillable reports on the health and safety workspace. So if you drill into these um, clickable performance analytics, you can actually drill in and see the data points and information at a record level. Again, why we did this is to get more information for our health and safety agents to have that visibility across their enterprise and see um, at a granular level, the information that's being submitted by employees. So if we were to drill into the investigations or even open incidents by location, we can see at a record level those incidents pending on your security role. We have made some other enhancements to the workspace, essentially for uh, an enhanced user experience. So we, based on feedback, based on user experience from our customers from research, we have updated um, some of the workspace to have a better flow, a better user experience, make it easier for your users. So some of the updates will be detailed fields have been rearranged to move related fields closer together. Um, so once you update, if a field is no longer in the space that you saw it in before, it's because we moved it to have related fields closer together. We now at the top of every um, incident as we're going through and creating an injury, an illness, an investigation, um, there will be the parent record of that incident in a, um, and you can click into it and it will take you back into that health and safety incident. Um, and last, if you hover over the description information on the tabs, uh, you can, it will help identify um, that for you. And so I'll just quickly showcase what I mean by that. So if we click into this health and safety incident up here, it will take us back into the original incident. And if we hover over this, it will just tell you um, what the tab is for in health and safety team member who has multiple incidents, multiple 
investigations going on. Um, this just helps with the ease of use and navigation so they know what they're looking at um, and they're not getting as lost with the tabs being opened. Our next minor enhancement is now a contact list knowledge article. So out of the box, you will have a knowledge article um, giving visibility of who to contact in case of an emergency. And so um, this is just for organizations and for customers who want to um, have some of that out of the box readiness. Uh, you can fill in your health and safety contacts in case of an emergency. You can associate this to the health and safety incident or observation. So um, if they were to begin creating an incident, they need to know who to contact. Uh, you can have all your health and safety contacts in one place. We also have had some enhancements to our incident here. Uh, again, creating a quality of life enhancement to the user experience based on feedback. So the updates here are explanation and instructions for form fields. So we now see the little question mark. If you hover over that question mark, it will give you some more uh, context for what should be filled in. This is to ensure that employees within self-service, if it's a newer process for them, are submitting the correct information on the first go around, um, reducing some of that back and forth, but also guiding and assisting your employees with this experience. The date and time field has been changed to the occurred on date, and that's to avoid confusion. Um, many times we were finding from, from customers that employees, when they're injured, their first instinct is not to report a health and safety incident. Their first instinct is to call for help or get assistance uh, following their injury. So if they're going back and reporting this at a later date, um, say they're feeling better, they need to go report it. It's just um, some clarification so they know that you don't report the incident for when you're reporting it, you report the incident for that occurred on date. So if it's a few days later, um, you would be able to date that. And last, we have links out to the observation on the incident record or vice versa, links out to an incident on the observation record. It's just to help with navigation and ease of use if the employee chooses the wrong catalog item. So say the employee, when they're going through self-service, they start to report an incident. They realize that it's actually an observation. I'm observing something. I'm not injured um, or vice versa. And it's to help our employees navigate it with their self-service. We then added also the ability to communicate to health and safety teams in my request. So after a health and safety uh, incident is submitted, we now have the ability to type back messages to that team. Um, it is a quality of life enhancement to um, using the out of box capabilities that are available in play centers. So if you are familiar with other ServiceNow products, this is something that is consistent across the board. We wanna make sure that experience is consistent. Um, so now employees are able to communicate and track the status of their request in the employee center. Um, and there will there are now email notifications and notifications if employee if changes are made to the request. So I did want to show we look in our demo instance really quick. We can type back a message to our team here. Say, for example, Maria remembers something else about her health and safety incident or she needs to update it. She is now able to do so and type messages back to her team. And if she needed to check the status of the request, uh, it would live within her employee center right here. That is everything I have prepared to show for our health and safety updates. I'll now pass it over for, to Elizabeth for our space recommender enhancements. Thank you very much, Claire. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. I'm going to now be presenting uh, one, of our, one, of the, uh, one of the features that we actually released back in February, but have done some in, enhancements to since. So in February, we released Space Recommender. So uh, giving the ability to an employee or a manager to request more space, depending on if they've got a team expansion, a team consolidation, they need to have their, their spaces rearranged. So this way they can submit a space assist request to request more space uh, and uh, get this approval to have this, uh, actually the layout changed for them. So the easiest way for me to actually show you this and go through the enhancements is actually to drive you through the entire flow of how this 
uh, feature works. So I'm going to start off here by logging in as an employee. So uh, in my instance right now, I'm on the employee center, and this employee is going to want to uh, submit a space request to, to, because she's got a team expansion. So she's going to go and browse all. We can then scroll down and see the space assist request. She's going to come in here and select. And from here, she'll be able to fill out this full form and add all the detail uh, going along with what she actually needs. So let's say here the request name, she's going to say it's a team expansion. She can give it a specific name if it's a project, uh, give all the de details she needed in there for the actual name. Who is she requesting it for? Emily is the employee I'm logged in, and she is the person that needs this uh, space. So we're going to request it for her. Are we going to want to allocate it to a specific department, cost center? All this can actually be chosen in this form. And then she can also de decide uh, and define which business, uh, which department she's actually uh, working for. So right now, Emily is part of our business development uh, department. So she's requesting the space for her team, which is part of this department. She'll then be asked to fill out, sorry, the reason for why she's submitting this request. So right now this is uh, going to be an expansion because she's got getting more people to her team. She can decide on which assignment type she actually wants. Does she want her uh, team members to be on the permanent assignment or do they, does she, is she looking for, for some flex assignment types? So this we're just going to select flex and then she can decide what kind of space type is she looking for? Is she looking for uh, meeting rooms? Is she looking for desks? Is she looking for quiet spaces? She can define here whatever space type she's uh, actually looking for. And then she will define the actual quantity of how many spaces does she need for her team. So right now her team is, uh, or let's say her team is of eight people. She's getting two new people to the team. So she would like a space where 10 people can actually sit together and collaborate. And she would like the uh, layout to actually match exactly the what she has set out. So she doesn't want to to have th uh, three workspaces and then seven uh, conference rooms. She wants them all to be workspaces and all within the assignment type flex. From here, she's also going to decide which location she wants. So she can go come into here and actually select the region site. She's also going to select here a campus. So let's go for this campus and let's say. It's building A. I can ask uh, to have it an exact match, or I can say, uh, let's not have an exact match. It can be A or B. It's not going to be much uh, much different. We'd prefer it to be A, but of course, we want to have all the possibilities and then be able to see what would suit best. And then she would define what day she would like to move into this new space and what day she would like to vacate the, the previous space she was in. So from there, she's going to submit. Just for time, I will go into one that was previously created just to show you the process. So from here, uh, Emily, the employee, will have to uh, validate the, the options that the system is going gonna, is gonna to show her. So on this page, in her request, she'll be able to see exactly here. This is the request that she has uh, put forward. This is what she would like. Attachments, if she'd added uh, a document, a photo, she'd also be able to retrieve it here. She'll be able to see the three different options that the system suggests. So the options take into account what she has pre-filled, but also the recommendations from the organization that they have set. So the recommended rules that have been set at the instant level to come up with these suggestions. So these uh, suggestions and options will actually be apparent on this screen and will have a percentage to, to show uh, Emily, the employee, how much uh, they actually fit the, the request that she has put in. So are they 90% uh, the same? Are they 69% because the, there may be different options for her to actually uh, uh, sit in, this, in, the, in a different layout? So from here, what we've done as an enhancement is an easier way to actually visualize these spaces. So Emily, the employee, can actually come into here and have the map load and see exactly what this option uh, entails. So where the, the space is that she has requested where they will actually be. So from there, she can zoom in and see, oh yes, those are close by, these could work. They're not ideal, but this could perhaps work for the team because they'll be close by in a similar uh, layout. She can also visualize the following maps. Uh, from there, she will get a to-do to -do task. Uh, and here she will ha actually have to submit the, the option that she prefers. So this page has also uh, had some enhancements. We've added, again, so the map view and an easier way for her to actually select the option that 
most fits her needs. She can either select one of the three of them or actually say, none of those work for me. Uh, I do not want to select any of the but any of the above uh, options. So let's say Emily here is going to select the first option. She's going to submit that. And from there, one of the enhancements that we've added is actually an approval flow. So from there, let's say Emily, Emily has submitted the, the request for option one and her manager will then, if I log in here uh, on the manager, this is Maria, this is the manager of Emily. Maria will receive a task uh, for approval of this actual request from her uh, employee. So if I go into my tasks, Maria will be able to find the approval for request. From here, she can either say, yes, I approve, or she can reject it. Maybe uh, the team is expanding, but they do not need to change floor, or for any reason that Maria would not want this to happen, she can uh, reject the, uh, the request and actually add comments, or she can approve it, but also add comments to it. So let's say here Maria is approving. She approves of this of this request. And so then the next step from here would be to go to the to the space planner. So here changing the screen again, I'm logged in as Roger. Roger is the space planner within the organization. So this person actually is in charge of all the facilities, the space plan, the layout of uh, the actual offices. And Roger has access to Workplace Central. So Workplace Central, as Alison was mentioning earlier, he would have access to all the dashboards uh, via Workplace Central, which is in Workspaces. And from here, if we scroll down, we'll be able to see all the space requests that are being submitted from the organization. He'll also be able to view uh, how many are actually uh, in process. He'll be able to view the state of them, who are they uh, requested by, and uh, understand what is happening uh, with these cases. From here, he, he can actually click into them and get the full detail of uh, who has requested this, have they been approved, the status, uh, what has actually been requested. And once he has approved, uh, all this change, he can then auto deploy. This is one of the new enhancements is auto deploy this. So this will create a plan for him, for all these uh, changes to actually happen. So as in a similar way that the, uh, Emily, the employee could do, he can also uh, click on the space plan and view the map. So uh, not just saying that these would be the new, the new uh, desks that will be assigned to the team, but these specific spaces located on the map to give him a more visual idea would uh, actually help him understand the different changes that will happen. And he can also view the approvals. Has the manager actually approved of this uh, change? If not, he does not have the uh, opportunity or the possibility to actually deploy it. The deploy button would not be visible if the, the status is not approved. But if, if it is approved, he'll be, then be able to select deploy and all these changes will actually happen. So that's what we have today in our May release as enhancements for our uh, space recommender feature. And from there, I'll pass it back to Alison, who's going to run us through some of the indoor mapping uh, enhancements for May. Great. Thank you, Elizabeth. Let me just get our slides reshared. All right, so I'm going to talk through the enhancements that we have made in this release related to indoor mapping. And first off, one of the things that I'll call out is that indoor mapping and map visualization has been a pretty large investment for us within workplace service delivery for quite some time. Um, and this is actually based on an acquisition of a third party that we um, released initially last May. And so we continue to make investments to really make this an interactive experience for employees as they're using maps. And we're also very focused on the administration and the use of what we call Map Studio. So I'll just walk through a quick slide summary to explain some of the larger enhancements that were in this release. <clears throat> so first and foremost, this update and enhancement is pretty simple. We are now able to ingest larger AutoCAD files. So you can see the size increase here. Um, I will say that a majority of files are not this large, but we wanted to op uh, offer that additional flexibility. Obviously, as you add more and more layers and more components to a CAD file, it grows in size. And so we've increased what we are able to ingest and import into our Map Studio. We've also um, added the ability to actually automate um, the computation of your building boundary. So previously, this was a manual exercise. You would import your file 
into Map Studio, and this is something that you would essentially have to um, manually click around and compute. But now there's just this simple checkbox that you can enable to automate this and remove this from your Map administration team. So it's really driving efficiency for them as they're importing a new floor plan. The other thing that we've done is we've made some enhancements to the data sync. So we actually have um, some tables that you initially import your uh, data in for indoor mapping. And then there's this process to actually sync that fully to workplace service delivery. And so things like the ability to um, actually uh, delete spaces and synchronize those um, are things that we have enhanced as part of this release. And I will say that this topic gets to be pretty deep and complex, especially if you've never used the synchronization um, capability. So what I would direct you to is if you're interested in more details here to check out our product documentation and it specifically outlines everything that you can do with this data sync and what was specifically changed as a part of this release. And the other thing I want to call out is the fact that we've added some notifications. So going back to that concept of synchronizing your, <clears throat> your data from those indoor mapping tables to workplace service delivery, one of the things that we've added is automatic notifications that you can um, enable in your instance to inform your map administration team if there is a change that has not been synced. So I'll give an example. Let's say that you have initially imported a floor plan and then later you go back and you import a new floor plan with some changes. Um, we would detect those changes. And if you haven't synced those back to workplace service delivery, we're going to trigger your map administration administrator um, team uh, a notification to just let them know that that is unsynchronized, but it has been detected. So really just a safeguard in place to make sure that they're aware of that. Okay, and that was the last enhancement that we wanted to walk through for indoor mapping. So I am going to pass it back to Elizabeth again to talk through all of the enhancements that we have delivered focused on reservations for this release. So Elizabeth, right back over to you. Perfect. Thanks, Alison. So coming back to sharing my screen, let's go back this way. I'm going to start again on the employee center. The easiest way again to go through these enhancements, since there's quite a few minor enhancements, is to actually take you through the reservation experience. So here logged in as an employee, I'm going to uh, actually go and make a reservation and then uh, drive you through these latest enhancements. So from here, nothing has changed. I still go to the portal, actually look uh, for a new reservation, and uh, I arrive on this uh, reservation portal. From here, I can still select the, the, the module I want. So right now, the employee is looking at hosting an all-hands event. So the idea is to book a conference room to be able to invite guests. The, this employee is part of the customer success team. And since this uh, all-hands session is driven and is going to be led by his team. He would like only to uh, reserve the space for his team, but also he would like to reserve it within the neighborhood of his team. So I'm actually going to here going to select the browse by neighborhood to be able to see what conference rooms are available within the neighborhood I am assigned. And so we can see here one of the first features uh, or enhancements that was actually added is the auto fill of these uh, of these items. Browsing by neighborhood is going to auto fill uh, whichever neighborhood the employee that is browsing is actually assigned to. So this will be pre-filled uh, to the neighborhood they're assigned to, along with the, the building in which they, they are assigned. So this will take the information from the workplace user table to actually here auto fill the campus to which he is assigned. And another enhancement that we can also see on this first page is the ability to browse by neighborhood, but also multi-building reservations. So I can create a reservation for this uh, conference room within the Australian office, but maybe the team is also spread out on a different location, and I can also uh, add another site to this reservation. So right now, let's say I want to create this meeting for uh, next month. Next month, we're going to have uh, a meeting to close the quarter, so the customer success team would like to, would like to meet and celebrate this. So this employee is actually going to go in and select a date saying I want to book it on the July 20th. Right now we can see that I'm selecting the 20th, but this is not possible. This is because the organization has uh, apparently set the reservation limit to we cannot book past 30 days. The only day I can book to right now is uh, July 15th. So today we are, I believe, June 15th. And so I cannot actually book past the 30 days that my organization has set 
This is set at the reservable module level. Uh, previously, this also existed. However, it was not enforced, meaning that an employee could uh, beforehand could actually make a reservation past the, the date that was set by the organization, but then that reservation was later canceled. Right now, this is enforced, so the employee can actually not even uh, try to make a reservation past that day. So right now, I'm just going to say, let's have it on July 13th. I'm going to save this, and I will search for spaces that are uh, made available. From here, I can actually see which spaces uh, are for reservation. I still have my three ways of seeing which rooms are available. So the map view, the schedule, or the card view. I'm just going to stay on the map view, and I'm going to select a specific space. From this space, I'm going to add it to my, uh, to my cart and select next to actually be able to reserve it. Why is this? Mm -hmm. If I just move this up there, sorry, technical zoom problem. All good to go. So from here, I'm creating my all hands sessions. So I'm just going to call it all hands. Let's call it Q2. I can uh, again decide if it's private, add a Zoom link. All this has uh, remained the same. One in one of the enhancements, however, is the fact that I can add uh, meeting room notes. So I can add here. I can say hi. Or and I can add the a meeting room. The, the meeting agenda. Why are people coming into the office? Why do I want guests to come in? What are we going to talk about in this session? I can actually define here in the notes. And this note, these notes will actually be sent out to the uh, to all the invitees. So either internal or external with the reservation details. So this is one of the, the new features that was released in uh, our May release. From here, I can continue and add visitors or team members. This has remained the same. Uh, I'll just go ahead and add a third one. And uh, continue down and let's say this is a special event. So I want to continue and I want to add catering. So from this, I'm going to say I want to add lunch. Let's add Lux lunch and let's add a quantity of three. So this part is has remained the same. I'm just going to submit the reservation because actually the editing of the reservation is some of the enhancements that we have made uh, in this release. So from here, I can see the confirmation of my reservation. I can see my uh, three uh, people that actually will be attending this session. And what I actually want to show you is the editing of this reservation. So previously, when I wanted to edit a reservation, I was changing the date, time, or location. The extra services that I added, so the lunch, could uh, were not carried over with my reservation. So this was a problem. This uh, had to make I had to make sure that as an employee, I was always going back, confirming that I did add the extra service and make sure that that extra service was uh, with the res reservation I created. But right now, let's say here, if I do not want this one, I'm going to unselect it and I'm going to select this specific meeting room. Maybe if I make it bigger. So if I select this meeting, I want this meeting room instead because it's got more light. This would suit uh, us better. So I'm, I'm going to add this one and I'm going to remove the one that I'd previously selected. From there, I'm going to continue. So from here, my the, not much has changed other than the location in which I'll be having my meeting. I didn't, didn't change the time or date, but I could have changed the time and date. Uh, but I want to make sure that my services are actually carried over with my reservation. So right now, if I just click on update reservation, it's going to give me this message saying, are you sure you want to confirm this reservation without uh, retaining your uh, services that you've actually added to your initial booking? So I am going to make sure I want to retain them. So I'm going to go back and make sure that they are retained. And this uh, message here, which has been added in May, is going to enable me to simply say, yes, I want to retain it. Yes, meaning I do want this lunch to be delivered to this new location, this new time, this new date, or no, I'd like to discard it. One of the things is that if this extra service is not available, uh, so let's say I book a meeting room, I add lunch uh, to the meeting room, and then I change the date and time and or do it in a smaller smaller space that does not have the possibility to have the extra service. I would have a message here saying that this service is not available in, a, in the new location. So I would always get a warning message uh, regarding the extra services. So right here, I'm just going to click on retain and I want to retain these services to this new location and then just update the reservation. I can also update the notes. 
All these updates will also be transferred to everyone uh, actually attending the session for them to have the up-to-date information. So a few other updates I also wanted to discuss with you is regarding the mobile. So I mentioned the uh, booking only 30 days in advance. Uh, on the mobile, the, the employee will actually get a view before making a reservation that he can actually only book in, up until 30 days. So he could not book past those 30 days. He would get that initial uh, message even before choosing the reservable module. He would also get the um, enabling him to uh, reserve by neighborhood. So in uh, a couple of releases ago, we enabled on portal to, uh, to book via neighborhood. This is now possible as of May via the mobile. The only item that is not uh, possible via the mobile that it is on portal is booking by neighborhood for multi-buildings. That is not yet today possible on mobile. Only uh, normal reservations can be made we are using the neighborhoods. So that is it uh, from, from my side for those um, May enhancements on reservation. Uh, I'll get it back to the team in case we have Q&A or anything else to share. And yes, that is it. Thanks, Elizabeth. And I'll share my screen again. Um, so if you would like to learn more about the May release, please check out our community page. This is where the recording um, will be housed as well as a blog will be released soon on all of the updates for May if you would like to read more in depth. So we'll now go to our Q&A portion. Um, if anyone has any questions about what they've seen or about um, anything in the May release, please feel free to put them down below and we will start answering questions. And not to put everyone on the spot here, we do have some frequently asked questions um, prepared here. So the first frequently asked question we get is, can both visitors and employees be tracked on the same health and safety incident? We covered this a little bit earlier, but yes, both employees and visitors can be tracked on the same incident. So you will not have to create multiple incidents um, for the same incident for different um, people involved. Everything can be logged on the same incident. Um, our second question here is, can approval flows be added to space assist requests? Yes, additional approvals can be added. You can set those up. And our last question is, are neighborhood reservations available on mobile? And I believe Elizabeth covered this a little bit, but yes, employees can use the browse by neighborhoods on mobile. However, multi-building multi, multi by neighborhood reservations cannot be done. And it seems that we have a question from Robert. Um, are plans to allow for a visitor to reserve a space like a desk or a parking spot? Um, and I'll open that up to our team here. Sure, yeah, I can chime in. So today the way that this works is employees who are licensed for workplace service delivery would be able to make a reservation on behalf of a visitor. Um, but definitely thank you for that suggestion. I will say under Safe Harbor as a blanket statement that visitor management and that experience for both the guests themselves as well as employees is an investment theme. Um, but because this is a public call, I can't share much more than that. But thank you for submitting that idea. Appreciate it. And then Claire, I know earlier in the webinar, we got two um, questions from attendees. I went ahead and answered them in writing, but just because we have a couple of minutes, I can spend some time um, adding additional context to the questions. So oh, yeah, yeah, we did receive one question on our location hierarchy. So just asking more about that. So it, this question I think was asked Elizabeth when you were going through um, some of the details on reservation management. And the question was like, how did we create that structure? How did we know all of the, all of the detail? And so um, we do offer what we call our workplace location hierarchy, um, and that is region, site, campus, building, floor, area, and space. And I sent the link to the documentation there and want to call out that this extends uh, the CMN location uh, table, if you're familiar with that. Um, and really, this is a backbone, of course, as you all saw, of a lot of things that are going on in workplace service delivery, whether that's a reservation or whether it's even binding some of that uh, indoor mapping data um, from the map visualization to it. 
So that was one question. And then we also got a question on um, where you can find the information on your CAD file guidelines if you are trying to import those files into Map Studio. So again, I sent that link um, and also a video, but that is out on our community site. So that's the same site that Claire was referring to a couple of moments ago. That's where we really invest um, in providing content from the product team um, to help our customers and partners. So that's where those guidelines are. And that's where that video is that um, actually walks through some of those, those guidelines and best practices if you do need to make tweaks to your files. And I believe, Claire, I don't see any other open questions at this time. So we're caught up on the live Q&A. Okay, sounds good. Well, we'll give it a second to see if anyone has any more questions, um, but if not, we can give you back some time and thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you.